our special guest, uh, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, uh, and uh, we're, we're, you can't imagine how excited we were when uh, we found out that she agreed to do this uh, to to do this event, um, and um, and she is the founder and director of the Pediatric Public Health Initiative of Michigan State University and, Her and Hurley Children's Hospital in Flint, Michigan. Um, she did the science and advocacy that finally got government action to take place during the Flint uh, water crisis. Uh, and she is a true public health hero. Um, when we were looking for someone um, that could link uh, environmental justice and public health, um, we were, um, uh, I guess, a uh, little starstruck when we uh, found out that she was going to be available uh, and that she had agreed. Um, and so, um, because she is, um, um, because her life and her work is the perfect embodiment of how these two issues are, are integrated, integrally connected. Dr. Mona um, is also here to talk about her new book, um, What the Eyes Don't See, a story of crisis, hope, and resistance in an American city. I get the stool because I'm really short. It's awesome. Thank you for the stool. Um, it is it is amazing and humbling and such an honor to be here um, with really so many heroes uh, in the field of environmental justice. And I want to start by taking you kind of towards the the middle of the Flint story. Um, when I was talking with a, a pediatrician colleague of mine, and he turned to me. Um, we were in the clinic and he turned to me, he's like, Mona, have you ever heard of this concept called environmental injustice or environmental justice? And I just smiled. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit of my background. Um, we heard some amazing family stories that really um, molded people's careers already today and, and why they do the work that they do. Um, so my path to medicine and to pediatrics was a bit atypical. Um, I started out as a community organizer. Um, I started out as a tree-hugging environmentalist. Um, so I was in high school, um, and I was young. I was 13. Uh, got involved in my high school environmental club, and we did what high schoolers do. We recycled cans, and we put on plays for the elementary school. Um, but then we found out that there was a trash burning incinerator in an adjacent city, and that that incinerator was literally in the backyard of an elementary school and a senior center, and that the kids in that neighborhood had one of the highest asthma rates, and we've heard about this already, and that the adults had high rates of COPD or respiratory disease. So my environmental group leader was amazing, and she got us involved in a real fight, in a real environmental fight, and we door knocked, and we protest, and we organized, um, and this was all led by a courageous mom who was a nurse, and we finally elected um, a local state representative who went into the state legislature, he won, and the very first thing he did was pass a law that an incinerator could not be located that close to an elementary school. And that incinerator has been closed for 20 years. It's amazing, 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 amazing. So I was a kid, I couldn't even drive. My parents would like drop us off to these like protests and like just don't get arrested. Um, but at that young age, I realized the importance of having a voice, of being an activist, the role that environment plays in your health, the impact it has on vulnerable communities, and the power of elected officials to do good. And so I went on, I created my major in environmental health, and then I also realized what, something else that we heard today, that kids are impacted first and impacted disproportionately by environmental burdens. So I went on to be a pediatrician. To, to care for those kids, but very much espousing all of these concepts of environmental health and of environmental justice, environmental and public health. And so when that colleague of mine, after the Flint water crisis had erupted, 
and said to me, have you heard environmental justice? What that is? Have you ever heard of that concept? I just looked it up on Google. I'm like, of course I have. I've, I've known what it has been and what it is for about a couple decades because I fortunately went to college at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources. We have some alum here. And I was blessed to learn about those concepts by some of the fathers of Netfield, Bunyan Bryant, Paul Mohai, who were influenced by Charles Lee's work. So I was blessed to have really that training and really be at the right place at the right time with the right team and the right village um, and the right access to data to do the work that I did in Flint. So obviously you have hopefully heard of, of Flint and our water crisis, and by now you know that it is probably the most emblematic environmental and public health disaster of this young century. It is a story of what happens when the people charged with keeping us safe care more about power and money than they do about us or our children. But I'm here to share that the story of Flint, and you know this by now, is not an isolated story. It is a story of really the deeper crises that we are in right now as a nation. It is a story of what happens when you take away democracy. It is a story of what happens when we deny science, a total disrespect for science. I don't need to tell you what kind of, how this reflects on what's happening today. It is a story of what happens when we disinvest in infrastructure because of austerity and inequality. But once again, it is a story of an environmental justice that was not the first environmental injustice, but a story of environmental injustices that continue throughout this nation to this day. So I wanna kind of rewind and share a little bit of kind of what happened in Flint, how we got to where we, are, we were, and, and really more importantly, share where we are. So Flint was really suffering from decades of crisis and decades of really environmental injustices because of massive manufacturing. And Flint was in a near bankruptcy state in 2011. And right away, overnight, Flint lost democracy. We were under the control of a financial emergency manager who had one job, and his job was, was austerity. It was to save money, no matter what the cost. And that emergency manager reported to the governor there was the no role of elected local officials. And it was decided that the water that we had been getting from the Great Lakes for half a century was too expensive for this poor, predominantly minority community. And that we would stop getting water from the Great Lakes, and instead we would draw water from the local Flint River until a new pipeline to the Great Lakes was to be built. So any Michiganders in the audience? Some, show me, show me how you tell me where you're from. Show me your, okay, point to where you're from. All right, look around. This is really cool. If you're not from Michigan, California can't do this, okay? So if I'm Flint area, are you from Flint? Saginaw, north of Flint. Okay, so Michigan is the mitten state, right? So we have a lower peninsula. We also forget we have an upper peninsula. But, but and here's Flint, literally kind of in the middle of, of the mitten. So why are we the mitten state? What, what are we surrounded by? The Great Lakes, okay, so we don't have a water accessibility issue. So we are surrounded by the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are the largest source of fresh water in the world. 20% of the fresh water in the world is around the Great Lakes. Yet to this day, we have a city that cannot turn on their tap and drink safe water. So it was decided it was too expensive for this poor, predominantly minority city. And in April of 2014, by a very simple flip of a switch, we started drawing our water from the local Flint River. And it didn't seem right. And the heroic people of Flint absolutely raised their voices. And they said, my water is brownish and greenish, and it tastes weird, and my kids are getting rashes. And we had bacteria, and we had boil advisories, and then they dumped a lot of chlorine, and that felt like people were taking a bath in a swimming pool and drinking bleach that irritated skin and eyes. Then we had so much chlorine in this water, it led to a high level of disinfectant byproducts, which are carcinogens. And just a few months after this water switch, General Motors, which was born in Flint, stopped using this water because it was corroding their engine parts at their plant. 
So think about that. Our water was corroding engine parts. But the entire time, the state of Michigan was telling the people of Flint to relax, that everything was OK. So the Flint water was missing an important ingredient called corrosion control, federally mandated ingredient. And without that ingredient, our water was 19 times more corrosive than the water that we were getting from, from the Great Lakes. And it was so corrosive that it ate up our lead-based plumbing. We have a lot of lead service lines. We have lead in our premise plumbing, which is the plumbing inside our homes. We had lead in water levels in the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of parts per billion. The EPA action level, which is not health-based, is set at 15 parts per billion. We had a home with a lead level of 22,000 parts per billion of lead in water. And that lead and water data came to us because of citizen science. So uh, an amazing uh, environmental researcher in Virginia Tech, Mark Edwards, when he heard that Flint wasn't treating their water properly, he was contacted by a mom, an amazing Flint mom named Leanne Walters. And he packed his minivan overnight with grad students and supplies. And he drove up to Flint and worked hand in hand with the people of Flint to prove that there was lead in the water. And they did. And they were attacked and dismissed and denied. And then by sheer randomness, I heard um, from a high school girlfriend who happens to be a drinking water expert, like have diverse friends in lots of different disciplines, who was at my house hanging out, drinking a glass of wine. Our kids were playing together. Um, and she. She shared that, um, that the water wasn't being treated properly. And because of this lack of corrosion control, there would be lead in the water. And that was a year and a half after the water switch. And that was the very first time I heard the word lead. And when a pediatrician hears the word lead, when anybody in public health hears the word lead, we freak out. We absolutely freak out because we know what lead does. It's a potent, irreversible neurotoxin. Incredible science has brought us to the point that we now know there is no safe level of lead. Levels we thought were okay decades ago when we had paint, and lead in paint and lead in gasoline, we now know are no longer okay. And I also freaked out because I also knew lead was a form of environmental injustice. Because I already knew my Flint kids already had higher levels of lead. Just like kids in Detroit and Chicago and Philadelphia and Baltimore, struggling with every toxicity, they now had this added burden. So in rapid speed and in kind of detective fashion, which you can read about in my book, um, we did the research to prove the impact, which never needed to happen. We never needed, I, my work never should have happened. This crisis should have ended when that first mom raised her jug of brown water and said there was something wrong. It should have ended when those car parts were corroding. It should have ended when we knew there was lead in the water. But to move this mountain that we were in, I knew I needed that cumulative impact or that impact that it was increasingly in the bodies of our children. So. As I said earlier, I, I literally walked out of my clinic and I stood up at a podium, but I was shorter. I could hardly like peek out. And I stood up at a press conference, which is an academic no-no. And I shared the science that after the water switch, our children had an increase in the burden of, of lead in their blood. And I was also attacked, just like everybody else who had raised any concerns in the story. And you know, for a moment, um, you know, the entire state, every arm of the state was saying I was wrong. They called me an unfortunate researcher, that I was splicing, dicing numbers, that I was causing near hysteria, which is also wonderfully sexist. And, and for a minute, I absolutely, I believed them. I was scared. I thought to myself, maybe I should have just stayed busy, pediatrician, mom, wife. Why did, I, why did I step out of my box? Why did I take this risk? I was physically ill. And 
ultimately it was the children that got me back in this fight and made me realize that my research, my numbers, my statistics were just, were not numbers. They were kids. They were kids that I, as a pediatrician, have literally taken an oath to protect. And we fought back. We fought back with more science, more evidence, more numbers. And finally, the state conceded and exposed this man-made crisis, raised by the voices of the incredible people of Flint who had been vocal throughout this crisis. And from that point on, we have been on a road to recovery. In Flint, we still cannot drink our water. We are still on bottled water and filtered water because our damaged lead pipes are being replaced. We've already replaced about 7,000 lead pipes. We've got about 10,000 more to go. We will only be the third city in the country that has replaced their lead pipes. There's a lot more work that we need to do as a nation. But I get to spend my every day working on the tomorrows of our children. We cannot take away what happened. There is no magic pill. There is no antidote. But there's a lot that we can do to promote the development of our children. So sometimes I say that I'm actually writing prescriptions for hope. But it's so much more than just words. So we've put into place things like two brand new child care centers, home visiting programs, trauma-informed care, behavioral health services, school health, school health clinics, uh, early literacy programs, um, home visiting programs, breastfeeding support. And the list goes on and on and on of things that we've been able to put in place to promote the development of our children. And we're also working on the bigger things that kids and families need, like restorative justice, that accountability, that's important. Self-determination, having a voice at the table, being partners in this work. Economic development, these are all things that kids need all over. And we hope to very much share our best practices of what we're doing in Flint with communities all over facing similar toxicities, be it the toxicity of, of lead, or be it the toxicities of poverty, lost democracy, austerity, racism, discrimination, all of these impact the life course trajectories of our children. I saw these wonderful signs at this conference about zip codes. Flint is one of those places. It's a place where a kid in Flint lives actually 15 years less than a kid in a neighboring zip code. And that's not unique to Flint, that's everywhere. And we need to do better for all of these kids because your zip code of birth, the water that comes out of your tap should not predict where you end up. So there have been incredible ripple effects of our Flint work and that's the story of kind of hope that we wanna share. People are paying attention to drinking water, they're testing, schools have done amazing work because there's lead in all of our water because the lead industry was evil and powerful for too long. People are talking about lead again. We thought lead was a problem of yesterday. It's a problem of today, it's a problem of tomorrow. We're talking about environmental injustice, as we should. Yes, it's been around for about 30 years, but we have a lot more work to do together. So I'm grateful to be here. I look forward um, to your discussion and questions. And once again, um, this, is, this is my community I started with, and it's great to be back in this community. Thank you, everybody.